Welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, my name is Margot Hoyt, and we're looking forward to kicking off this webinar event. Um, by way of introduction, let me uh, share with you that this has been a conversation series that we started earlier this year and before that in 2021. We've had a number of terrific speakers this year of note, Yvette Vargas and Tammy Heerman. If you didn't catch those live, those recordings are available on YouTube. But today, the main event, we're really looking forward to introducing you to Irina Konstanovsky uh, from Horizon Therapeutics. We're just thrilled that she's with us today. Um, a quick note about me. Uh, I am the North American Head of Learning and Development Solutions at LHH. If you're not familiar with LHH, we are not only doing business uh, with uh, organizations like yours in North America and in Canada, but in more than 60 countries. We partner with organizations who are going through cultural transformations, workforce transformations in a number of different ways. We help to recruit great talent through executive search and professional recruitment. Uh, we help on the learning and development side where I work in terms of uh, really shifting mindsets and skill sets for leaders through assessment, coaching, leadership development programs, even career development strategies and solutions. And the third part of our LHH business is career transition and mobility, really helping those who are looking for ways to refresh their careers, uh, both within your organizations or when they need to leave. Uh, at this point in time, let me turn on my video and introduce Irina, ask her to do the same. Um, a little bit about Irina while she does that. Irina is currently the EVP, CHRO, and Chief Diversity Officer at Horizon Therapeutics. And she's been there almost five years and uh, they've been lauded several times for their contributions for diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, she's an immigrant to the U.S. from Argentina, passionate about the advancement of women, and in particularly committed to pay equity across gender and ethnicities, and really looking forward to talking more to you about that, Irina, today. Um, also wanted to note that she's been credited for significant contributions to Horizon Therapeutics being named to Fortune's 100 Best Companies to Work For two years in a row. So much to celebrate there, and so much for us to talk about today, Irina. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you, Margo. Good to be here. So, Irina, I wanted to just start out with a really um, generic and a nice, easy question to kind of get into things. Um, you've had such a wonderful career to date, much more to come. But tell us a little bit about your journey and some of the milestones uh, and real, you know, uh, highlights along the way. Yeah. Um, so I had a, a pretty straightforward career, um, you know, I, I, but, but there were some shifts and, and such along the way. And I, I, I like to, to highlight some of those. Um, you know, I came to this country uh, a long time ago in 94 for what I promised my family would be two to three years, um, maybe four. I was coming to do a PhD in education. I was a teacher in Argentina. I knew nothing about the corporate world. It had never been in my radar to think about the corporate world. So um, came to this country to do a PhD in education and pretty fast I realized I didn't wanna do a PhD. It was too theoretical and too conceptual for me. Um, and I wasn't that happy in the communications department and uh, in the education department, I'm sorry. And ended up, um, you know, I was at Cornell University, excellent program in industrial labor relations, human resources. I ended up thinking about maybe transitioning into um, human resource management through the training and development kind of um, bridge that I could make uh, from being a teacher. So I got to the program and I, I promise I'll accelerate in a minute. I won't stay 94, 95, 96, <laughs> a long time. But I got to the program and, you know, first thing they tell me like a week into the program is, uh, you know, find a suit for summer internships. And I'm like, what are you talking about? Like, we teachers rest in the summer. Um, so it, it, you know, I, I, I was just not familiar with the corporate world at all. So um, it was drinking from a fire hose, you know, got to my summer internships. It was the high of a labor market that I hit there by chance, got different offers. But the, the two I wanna talk about is one, I got an offer to work for a consulting firm and I was really intrigued about consulting. Um, and then I got an offer to work for GE in their rotational development program, which was kind of the, the 
gold standard of where you could go right. and learn human resources. So went to work for GE, um, did my rotation for two years. They were two great years, but I wasn't that happy with so all the mobility required. And here's where you know, some of the challenges of us uh, women come into the game. At this point, I'm married. I'm married with someone who's finishing his PhD. And um, I, the GE is imposing a kind of mobility that I'm not sure I can, I can do. Um, you know, my next assignment is in Germany. Um, my husband at the time, can, my new husband cannot move. So, you know, like all of those things happen. And I had stayed in touch with um, the consulting firm because I had been intrigued by these during the, the, the process. And, and so I called someone, I said, can we go for lunch? I need some advice. Um, you know, what to do here? You know, the, I work for GE, great company. What, what should I do? And, and I ended up going to work for the consulting firm. Um, so that's how I got to, to Towers Perrin at the time. It then became Towers Watson, then became Willis Towers Watson post, post me leaving. Um, anyway, so I worked for, for, I worked for the firm for, I worked in consulting for 16 years. So I stay in the firm for a very, very long time. Uh, I moved through three different offices, uh, moved through several roles and responsibilities in the firm. I got the opportunity to get PL responsibility, which um, we'll talk more about, but I would encourage uh, most women who have an opportunity um, to, to get PL responsibility because I think it's one of the gaps that we have when you look at women in leadership. Um, so I got the opportunity to manage a business. I, you know, I, I, I thought I would stay forever in the firm. The firm was great to me and I did good work for the firm. And then, um, circa 2012, um, one of my clients, um, Baxter healthcare, um, you know, was looking for a head of talent and I was trying to help them find the right head of talent as a good consultant. I would, I wanted someone there who I knew and I trusted and, you know, who could continue doing the great work that we were doing with um, with Baxter. And, you know, the head of HR said to me, isn't it this time to drink some of your own medicine? And I had never thought about leaving consulting. I had not thought about going to the corporate world. I had an impression of the corporate world that I would be bored, that I, um, that, you know, I had multiple clients, that um, that it would be lame in some way, shape, or form. And then I, I once I, I got into the corporate environment, it completely opened my eyes. And, you know, today I would say I wouldn't go back to consulting. There's nothing wrong with consulting. I thought I would not leave it. But I'm, I'm, I, it was very eye-opening of what I didn't know, right? And again, as we think about careers, there's so much we don't know about sort of opportunities. Um, went to work for Baxter as the head of talent, uh, a great role. I learned a lot in that role. Um, during that time, we helped, um, you know, we helped with the, I led the people and culture separation spinoff of Baxalta, uh, created two companies. And that was probably to date the most challenging, difficult, hard and rewarding project I've been involved in my whole career, which was separating two companies. Um, and, uh, and, and, and creating two successful companies as a result of that. So I was very excited, you know, about the work that we were doing um, at Baxter, but then I also felt like I wanted to, I wanted to be sort of five years later, I wanted to sort of think about um, becoming a CHRO and um, taking the next step in my career. And, and I thought about it as the next step. And again, and, and we're talking about careers and how they evolve, because in some ways, um, you have to make different decisions when you are sort of the number one person. I, I didn't have sort of the head of HR to go say, hey, how do we solve for these or, you know, and sit at the table, sit at the CEO table where a whole different set of decisions are discussed and so forth. So I was, I was definitely thinking about my career, thinking about it. I was thinking that I wanted to start putting my resume together and exploring opportunities um, as the head of HR when I got a call from someone who had worked with me as a consultant at Baxter. So um, someone who had helped with the separation and, and we worked together in that process. And this person said to me, look, um, you know, I'm, I'm doing some consulting work for this um, company um, and they're looking for a head of HR and I gave them your name. So they are going to call you and it's Horizon. And I'm Googling Horizon. I have no idea who Horizon is, Margo. I have no idea at that point. Uh, Horizon was a very different company than who we are today. We were pretty small, um, you know, um, about 500 employees, very US centric. I had a lot of global experience that I was thinking this is not going to work. Um, um, you know, the company was just, just, you know, 
small and new and, you know, had all sorts of issues and troubles. Um, but I decided I wanted to explore this and um, went to an interview with the CEO, um, Tim Wahlberg. He's my CEO today. Um, and, and I told my husband on my way to the interview, I'm not interested in the job. I just want to test my story, right? I want to test my story. I have some gaps in my resume. And this is something, again, we should talk about. Women, you know, get very scared when they have gaps in their resume. I have always been a talent lady. So I grew through sort of the softer side of HR, if you want to call it that way. I mean, strong change management work. I did PNL. I had PNL responsibilities. Um, I did a lot of learning and development. I did a lot of talent change management, mergers, acquisitions. I didn't do comp. I didn't know what executive comp was. I mean, sort of uh, being paid, but, um, you know, I never knew how that was all fully decided. So, um, you know, I, I, I went to test my story with the CEO. I was very honest about my strengths and I was very honest about the areas where I did not have expertise and how I would um, fill some of those gaps. I had a fabulous conversation with Tim and, and left uh, two hours later and called my husband and I said, I want this job. I mean, there's something really special happening in this company. Um, this company is transforming and there is a, there is a, there is a, project here. There is, a, there is a vision of what we could be and what we can accomplish and what HR can do in this process. And I want to be part of it. So, um, you know, I ended up getting the job. I ended up being very, 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 very interested in the job. And one of the things I did was, you know, I created a whole plan for how I would do the job even before, you know, I, I was in, you know, even in a second round of job offers and, um, and then, you know, how I would complement some of my my gaps uh, in my resume and so forth. So, um, you know, got the job and I'm so glad I did because it's been an amazing journey. Um, you know, we went from 500 employees to 12 to one, uh, 2100 at the moment and counting tremendous growth, um, you know, 3 billion market cap to 25 billion market cap. Uh, I joined with a stock at 12, we're at 80 something, hit 120 a few months ago. Um, just, um, I think two or three medicines, we have 11 now. Um, you know, we didn't have an R&D department. We did not have an R&D department with about 370 people that work in R&D at Horizon today. So um, it's been a real opportunity to be part of something special that was being built. Um, so that's my, that's my story. But the one thing, and I'm sorry, I, I'll take a breath in a second, but uh, the one thing I, I, I like to share about my story, Margo, is, um, you know, I often tell people to have a career plan. I did not have one, not, not a clear one. Right, right. Um, and I think there is, um, look, I, I'm not advocating you shouldn't, I actually advocate you should, but you should leave a lot of room to explore the unknown, right? Because there's so much we don't know. And when we create a career plan, we do it based on what we know um, about jobs, what we know about careers, what we know about role models that we have today. We don't know what we don't know. So being open to the opportunity and being, um, being somewhat uh, also confident about your ability to take a risk, and the third lesson and the really important one is networks. I got all my three critical jobs in my career, uh, Towers Perrin at the time, Towers Watson, Willis Towers Watson, the firm, my consulting job, Baxter and Horizon, all three, I did not look for that job. Someone helped me get there because they knew me, they knew of me and a network, um, a good network got me there. So. Um, I don't know if that answers yeah. your story. <laughs> well, I think it's terrific. And it really does underscore that curiosity. You know, you, you started each chapter of this career story with, I didn't want to do that. And then I was open to having the conversation and could see how I could really fit into this next step. So I think that that's absolutely fascinating. Um, you mentioned that, you know, you, you worked at, at uh, Willis Towers Watson, or what's now known as that in the firm, um, at, but not a, a compensation expert, yet somehow pay equity is something that you're very passionate about in terms of saying how, how that enables advancing women, but also other ethnicities. Tell us about how that's important to you and why. Look, I've been, I've been, um, I've been trying I've been working on trying to advance women in the workplace my whole career. Um, maybe because I'm Latino and I wasn't supposed to have, a, you know, like I see so many forces at work um, to pull you to pull you back. There's a lot of forces at work, and I'm I'm not saying this apply to all of us. 
you know, but, you know, and, and I, I think I shared this story with you when we, when we met, you know, I, my mother is 92 years old and she's a rock and one of the, you know, the most important people in my life. And, and still my mother pulled me back, right? My mother pulled me back when I had kids, she was questioning, why was I traveling this much? You know, I was working for the firm and she would question these or, you know, my brother would be in some economical trouble. And I would say, why isn't my sister-in-law going back to teaching? She was a teacher. And my mother would say, well, she has two small kids. Well, I have two small kids too. And I like work my butt off. <laughs> so, um, you know, I, I think there's societal and, and being a, you know, coming from a Latino culture, you know, that, that becomes even stronger, right? But so there, I think there's societal issues and then I think the workplace is sometimes uh, not quite inviting in many of the systems and processes that we put in place. And then if you, if, you, if you add all of that, we can say all the good words in the world, but still to this day in 2022, in the United States of America, women get 83 cents on the dollar for what men make. And I'm talking about equal pay for equal work. I'm not talking about different jobs and all of, you know, of course, like, um, societal issues also lead women to have, you know, there's more nurses, women and more doctor men. I mean, like we know that. So, but I'm not talking about that. I'm talking nurses versus nurses. Women make 83 cents on the dollar when you take them in the aggregate. Uh, and that is, you know, you, you take ethnicity into the equation, you know, Latina women make 55, 57 cents on the dollar. I mean, it's just ridiculous. It's ridiculous. Right. We're doing the same work. So I don't know. I think at the point that I realized that this was going on, I'm the mother of two daughters. I've been an advocate of women in the workplace. And I started to think about how unfair this is and how I am an HR professional. I work in organizations. I have a say in how we pay our employees. I, you know, for sure, I cannot talk about diversity, inclusion, equity, if you're not like seriously looking at your pay practices. And so many companies don't want to look. It's a really, A, if they find inequalities, they have to fix it. Those are discrimination part, practices, and we know they are out there. So I'd rather close my eyes and not see them. And this is what others are doing. Or, you know, it's a super expensive proposition to fix it. You know, you're a big company and, and you know, it costs, I think, Starbucks millions of dollars to fix this problem. So... Um, for me, I don't know where my, where all this started, but it all came together at some point in my career that I could not continue to advocate and be a huge champion of women in the workplace and still not be, uh, you know, an activist when it comes right. to equal pay for equal work. Well, it sounds great. You know, when you say it out loud that, you know, equality or, um, equity, uh, is it's not just about the number of women in the workforce or the number of women at a certain level in an organization, but really let's talk about what are they taking home from that, right? And it Absolutely. would seem crazy not to do that. And I'm sure that in your conversations, people aren't intentionally doing it, but to your point, they're not actively not doing it either, right? They're not actively not doing it. Every, I am, and I, you know, I, I, I wrote a piece about this in LinkedIn a while ago, you know, I'm, I'm, absolutely sure that if we put 100 CEOs in a room of the best organizations in the world and we tell them, you know, there is a chance you're paying your women, you know, if, if we put this on the table, they will all say, no, we're not. Absolutely not. We're not paying it. But then if you say, okay, do a study and correct it and it might cost you a million dollars, a few million dollars, um, you know, many of them will go like, oh, well, maybe next year, maybe not now, maybe, you know, bad press, maybe this, maybe that, maybe mm, I'm sure I'm sure I'm not a problem. Yeah. Are you like do the study? It's not that expensive to do a study and to see and make sure that some of these biases that exist in society and that they carry through a number of mechanisms, a number of mechanisms are not at play in your organization. I can imagine that people who are watching this arena have a thousand questions for you. So I'm just going to take a second and remind people we are going to take uh, time for questions. We'll start at about 25 to we'll leave lots of time for your uh, for your questions. Put them in the Q&A section down below. So click on there and type your questions in and we'll get to those um, because I can imagine that there I have a lot of questions, but I, uh, I know there'll be lots from our from our watchers as well. Um, you know, I mentioned in the introduction that with your time and not that long, right? Not even quite five years, you've done a lot to raise the profile. You talked about how far Horizon has come in that brief period of time. 
Um, when you think about advancing women in 2022, coming out of COVID, coming out of all of the social unrest that we've seen, the economic unrest now that seems to be advancing, you know, what do you see as being as you know important with respect to advancing women, and and how has that changed over the past few years? You know, some of the I, I think we're more um, I think we're more uh, clear about some of the biases that are at work in many many places. I think that there is more clarity, but I think some of the forces continue to be in play. Um, I don't know that it has changed a lot, and it's kind of sad. And even if you look at representation over the years. You know, um, women graduate from college at higher, way higher rates, not way, but at least in the US, I think it's around 50 something, 55, 45. I mean, uh, don't quote me on that stat, but I think women graduate at higher rates from college and somehow we're losing women. Um, so they, they, it's not the level of education, sort of like we get to the level of education being somewhat at parity, although you can say, maybe choices that we make in it, you know, in, in where we go in, not where, but what choices do we oh, make sorry. in terms of careers? Um, but then as we progress, uh, we start to lose women in the pipelines. And, and um, you know, you end up with, I think in Fortune 1000, you have like 94% of uh, CEOs are men. It makes mm -hmm. no sense. I mean, if we think about it, it's almost like pay equity. It makes no sense that with so many capable women, we lose so many along the way. So. Um, you know, there's all sorts of forces at play, but for me, it's really, really important to try to to try to really uh, think through what are what what can we what can I influence, right? I, what I can influence is how do we make the workplace um, equitable? How do we make the experience of women in the workplace a better one? Um, I I, I want to do that for all the women that work with me. Um, and I want to do that also for, you know, for my kids and the generations to come, because um, I feel like over the years, something is still preventing sort of the more organic, natural move that you should be seeing um, in terms of, of career growth. Um, you know, I think pay equity plays a role in it, you know, when oftentimes if you have dual careers, very, very difficult to manage, but in a dual career setting, the women will take the back seat either because their mother tells her that that's the right thing to do or because right. they're making less money objectively they're making less money or they don't see a career a clear career path so if i take the back seat and allow your relocation and your move man um you know as the family we do better off so at the end of the day there is a lot of still like forces that that make the workplace inequitable for women uh, flexibility, being able to manage certain things, um, you know, again, uh, you know, a lot of other things that we can talk about, you know, I, I, I touched upon networks, women have a much harder time networking as we grow in careers, networks play a huge role in, in how positions get assigned in how that special project um, is given to a certain individual and so forth. And, and, and we, we're at a disadvantage. And I, I think there's work that we have to do personally to put ourselves in a better place. And then there's work that as a workplace we can do to enable some of that. But it's often very few women in the golf course where some of these relationships and trust are being built. There's very few women um, in the bar after work having a beer. Right when you right. see the groups of people that after work gather together to socialize, there's an overwhelming amount of men in that scenario. You know, I remember one of the CEOs I work with, you know, saying to me, one of the business leaders. Oh, I had, um, I had John. I'm gonna call him John because too many people know me around. So I had John last night in my house. He brought a good bottle of wine, and we discussed this topic, and we came up with a good solution. Can you imagine the CEO saying? I had Irina in my house and we open a good glass. That's un unheard of. So if 94% of CEOs are men and we can go out for a drink to debate some ideas because you know it's just the way it is, um, we're at a huge disadvantage when it comes to networking. Right. Are there things that you know your organization has done or that others can do? Because I think that there's a there's a there's a double side to this, right? There's so what can I do as an individual to improve my my mindset, my skill set, my ability to network, um, and then what can organizations do to either remove the bias that's, you know, towards the network and how strong an individual's network is, or create opportunities 
um, that are more, you know, balanced, if you will, for everyone to be able to get together and to be able to start developing their network. I think we're doing what many are doing. We're doing sponsorship opportunities. We're doing, we're trying to, you know, we have a women's network that really meets and tries to understand sort of some of these forces at work and how we can support people. We have done a lot of work on allyship. Um, you know, oftentimes I feel women are looking always for who is going to be their women mentor or, you know, we need, we need our allies. We need our men to help us in this process. Um, so how do we, how do we create better allies from our males, um, you know, peers and partners and, and, and employees? So we've done, we've done a lot of that work. But I think this is, this is daily work, sort of understanding our biases, right, too. I mean, many women, um, you know, I think about the talent review process, right? That's an incredibly important moment where we review our talent and decide who are our highest potential, highest performing individuals that then you know, are going to be like the names that come up when an interesting, important, challenging opportunity arises. Right. And, you know, being very careful about how we put some biases on the table, because both women and men sort of tend to think about, you know, performance. I think there's some studies here that show, you know, that when it comes to performance, we're kind of you know, at parity, like you would think, oh, this woman is a great performer. This man is a great performer. When it comes to potential, we women and men tend to put much more faith in the potential of men. Oh, they've never done it before. She hasn't never done it before. He has never done it before. Mm, we're going to have problems with she somehow. Right. Um, and those are biases. There are biases. There's so much bias still. Uh, in the equation, you know, we ended the talent review in my own company, and and it took a moment for someone to say, "Do you realize that when we were assessing women, we always did an assessment of their personality? Oh, they're and they're so nice to work with, and they're such a pleasure to work with. Oh, and she's so difficult to work with. Like there was always an assessment of their when we would, were doing the assessment of our men, we were not as that didn't show up. That didn't show up. Um, other things showed up. So somehow, you know, these are things that we go like, oh, shoot, like we need to correct this. Like we need to make, because people don't want to do that. Right, right. Um, and a really good, you know, looking in the mirror at our own policies and organizations and processes to say, which ones can we identify where we could, as you said, do the daily work, the daily yes. work to, yes. uh, to focus on where we can be stepping up. I love it. You know, one of the areas that we've seen statistics around COVID is, uh, or coming out of COVID, we hope, fingers crossed, um, is that women are starting to elect to leave the workforce or have a lot of pressure to leave the workforce. And there's a multitude of reasons why. I know this is not something that you are, uh, <laughs> are going to let us get away with. I'm, I'm going to put it that way. What are your thoughts around, you know, how do we lean into this? How do we deal with these challenges? It's super hard. I mean, I, and it's super hard because we're back to sort of the same conversations, right? It's easier for the woman to leave the workforce for a number of, of reasons. I, you know, I'm a huge advocate of women in the workplace. I, I, it's, I, I think I started my advocacy and championship of women trying to keep women in the workforce. I, I would see like very, um, um, I, I, I would know and be friends, and this is earlier in my career, right? At that time where this is, this is a real issue, which is like you're starting to have kids and, you know, in my case, I had a dual career situation. And so there's choices that you're making on a regular basis about what's best for your family and what's, you know, and I'm not saying that everyone is in that route, but there's a lot of people that are in that bucket, right? And, and that is a very, very pivotal moment for a lot of women who have, great career aspirations, great education, maybe a career path, whether they see it or not. And, and um, they decide to take the back seat. So this is not, I, I think the pandemic has sort of made it very, very hard for women because, you know, kids were, you know, they were teachers, they were, um, you know, caregivers back to, to things that, you know, make it, made it very, very hard for women not to take the back seat. And I think we took a few, um, years back of some advancement that we have been able to do. But as long as the workplace um, continues to sort of operate under um, uh, flexibility, flexibility is a huge component. It's a huge component for men too. If we don't give more flexibility to our men, then the women they're supporting at home, whoever they are, right? I may have the male working in my company, but their wife works somewhere else. Right. If I provide flexibility in the workplace, 
we enable better women, you know, we enable more women, even in other companies to do the work. Yeah. Parent leaves. I mean, you're in Canada, so it works completely different. But, you know, we still here get an eyebrow raise when we say, you know, we provide our dads the same kind of parental leave that our moms. And some people go like, what? Why? Why would you do that? Well, how do we support women in the workplace if we tell them they're the only ones who can stay home and take care of the kids? I uh, I don't know. I have a, a million examples, and I don't know that I answered your question. I get kind of get kind of passionate about these things. Well, it's it is a challenge. I mean, I think that there are some that are calling that this could set back the you know the progress that has been made for advancing women by decades, right? So nobody yes. nobody knows the exact answer, of course. No, but, but of course, that is a challenge. Yeah. And I think what's what you what you've raised here is you know. Uh, it may seem like the only option, but if we can dig in a little harder and seek that kind of flexibility and support to get through, you know, it's only a period of time, you know, for those who have young families, they're only young for a period of time. And we want to talk about, you know, the, the lifetime of a career, right? Um, or to get through elder care issues or to get through, you know, so there are flexibilities and support but organizations can't help unless they know what individuals are going through. Um, and individuals may not be able to see opportunities unless organizations are also sharing, communicating, promoting some of the flexibilities that they can offer. So, you know, it's, there's always both sides to it, but I, I just think it's a great thing to, to put out there in terms of it may seem like the only option, but I'm hopeful that there are there are other other options that we can think. Yeah, about. absolutely. Absolutely. Okay, the last question. So for those of you who are watching, you can start to get yours in the Q&A. But the last question that I wanted to ask you, Irina, is, you know, in 2022, I know you're talking to lots of women who work with you or you're a part of their support network wherever they work. What are your top pieces of advice for, you know, individual women like me, like those who are listening in terms of how do you advance your career? What do you need to I think, think it about? depends. It depends on where you are on your journey. But um, some of the advice that I, I've given women that maybe was sometimes either controversial or counterintuitive, I don't want to go with the usual blah, blah that we tend to say. One was I, I truly am a big fighter of women staying in the workforce. Um, I think the debate about, you know, can I be a good mom and can I be a can I have a career? We have to get out of that dichotomy if we can. Uh, I know in many instances, women exchange their salaries for daycare, right? And then they're like, what am I doing here, right? Like all my salary is going into taking care of the kids. Um, but unless you, uh, if you leave the workforce for seven or eight or nine years until things get settled and kids are in school most of the day and so forth, it's really hard to reinsert yourself in and to have a career path that it's not always behind sort of the significant other or the other men yeah. in the organization. So I'm a huge advocate of trying to keep women in the workplace. So um, I, I, I know that is a controversial issue and I know the million things that are against that, but just, just sharing one that I, anytime I can talk to a new mom who's saying, I'm thinking about letting my job go. Um, you know, I, I, I try to have a conversation and, and try to share some experiences of how maybe things can work and it's challenging. It's challenging. So um, that's one. Uh, the number two, and we hear it often, but um, go for it. Like you don't have to check all the boxes. I know we've, you know, I've probably people heard this a million times and still women feel very insecure um, to raise their hand or to, you know, lean into an opportunity if they don't feel like they're going to do a great job. And I would say, go for it, go for it. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, if you, yeah, obviously you're not going to, you know, if I, there's a realm of things I can do, not do, but, um, I think that's a really important one. And then the third one, and I talked about this earlier, but I, I do coach a lot of women to have, um, to build a network and to nurture their network. I often talk about my own personal board of directors, right? And these are people that over the years, They've been, they've known me. I've been very open to them about my challenges. I've been open to them about my fears, my vulnerabilities, my aspirations. And they have gotten great advice. And some of them are better advice when I have to uh, do, um, you know, an interview. And some are better advice when I have to make a career choice. I mean, there's a right. board, my personal board of director varies. I don't have one. 
I have a few, but I nurture them. They know how I'm doing. I try to have lunch with them. I write emails. I give back to them when I can, right? It's not a, it's not a, a one side relationship. And so that is one. And then other things, right? Uh, and I know this is, again, like controversial because it puts the burden on us. But, you know, like we go to our board meetings and on the weekend, they all play, they all, many of them play golf. Most of them men we're out of there. Like, and I, in the beginning, I was like, like a lot of things happen in that golf course. Like a lot of good conversations happen in that golf course. I'm using the golf course as an example, although it's real for anyone listening, it's real for me, but you might have your example of what your golf course is, right? Yeah, um, but then, you know, when they come back, I make an effort, even I'm tired and I have work to do to have a drink with them. You know, even if you drink Diet Coke and you don't want to drink, I actually do have a drink. Um, but but I'm saying like, and that's like, sometimes it's not what I want to do when it feels like lame and it's late at night. And, you know, and I'm using that again, all symbolisms of nurturing your network takes work. Yeah. Yeah. And Relationships that, take work, period. Take right. Work. Relationships take work. take work. Yeah. And we handle, I mean, again, I'm generalizing. I know a lot of our, hopefully we have. Um, a lot of men listening who feel identified with, we juggle so much on the family, personal, uh, on all fronts. Um, you know, lots of caregivers tend to be women and so forth. So, um, you know, like going for a drink at the end of work seems like a burden for most of us. It's fun for most of the men. So I think nurturing your networks um, is an important component. And so go for a drink. That's my advice. Yeah. Go, go for a drink. I'll, I'll take that advice. Um, but uh, you know, what's interesting is in, you know, lots of women that I've talked with and work with, you know, they, they speak about it as something extra to their work. Um, and sometimes it is done after hours, but a lot of networking and building of relationships can be done during the normal work day. And, yes. and quite honestly, it's an important part of how we can be effective in our current job, let alone the next job, right? Yes. Um, so that, that focus on what relationships are important, who do I have good relationships, where do I need to build relationships, that whole concept is something that, you know, it's a mindset shift. It's not just about socializing in case, right? It's really about building relationships that will help you current role, next role, the organization to connect differently, right? Love your point, Margot. So I was joking about going for a drink, although I wasn't, but I was joking, but I, a lot of it can be incorporated into the, into sort of how we work. How we work. Excellent. Great okay. advice. Okay. I'm going to start going to the Q and A's and see what we have here. Um, and this is a very, it's, it may be a basic question, but it's an important one. Someone's asked what, what are P and L responsibilities? How are we supposed to get them? We need to know what they are. Uh, for sure. Profit and loss. That's what I mean by P and L. Um, you know, but um, but what I mean by that is, you know, if you go back to statistics, you know, and you have like 5% of, of um, uh, about 24% of the C-suite in Fortune 1000 companies are women, 24%, like makes no sense. But, you know, we've been talking about why it makes no sense for a moment, but um, with so many women with really great degrees and great aspirations in their younger age, somehow that drops or drops, 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 drops. And I would say from that 24% in the C-suite, many of them are the head of HR or the head of communications, or, you know, we are not the people driving um, revenue, driving p and um, You know, I, I, uh, this is not Horizon. I mean, we just happen to have our top commercial leader be a woman, our top scientist be a woman, but it's not common. It's not common. Women do not have a lot of roles um, that have sort of financial responsibilities that, and those are the roles that in many, many companies, and again, we're generalizing, many, many companies lead to CEO positions, right? CEOs right. are people who had not only leadership roles, but they were able to, they manage sort of the whole financials and the revenues and losses of an organization. So I feel like we, many women shy away from those roles earlier in their career, and then they have a hard time getting a role because now they're too, maybe at that middle level, it's too hard to learn that. And then we are through a career path that will not lead to CEO roles. That right. was kind of my, I'm simplifying the complex. Yep. Yeah, and it's a, it's an important part of any you know rounding out your portfolio of experience. Um, so there's some info, some questions in here about when applying for a job that you knew you had gaps, 
how did you identify these gaps to make a plan to bridge them? Was it the job description? Was it your board of directors that was telling you? Um, what's that process like? And then how do you start to, to show how you're going to bridge them? Yeah, I think it depends, right? I think it, it depends on, 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 again, where you are in your career. It might be the job description. The job description might say these are the six or seven requirements for the job, right? And you read that job description um, and, um, and you go like, oh, I have three, but I don't have four. But can, what I've learned, the experiences I've had, can I transfer some of those experiences? Can I talk about how the experience I had in this other job is transferable to these. Can I talk about how I'm going to learn these? Can I talk about how I'm passionate about this? And although I haven't done it, I will put my life and heart into, into learning right. it. So okay. um, I think, uh, again, this is a cliche, but I see it every day. Like men who have three or four of the requirements, they're like, good, I can take this role. Like I'm, I'm good to go. I'll figure out the rest. Women right. know who have three or four of the requirements go like, I cannot possibly apply to this role. I have three pieces missing. Right. So when I say lead in and go for it is sometimes like, you know, we all like the best jobs we all had. Think about it. I don't know who's out there, but think about it. The best and most interesting job you've had, I'm sure, was a moment where you were asked to do something you hadn't done before or at a scale that you hadn't done it before, or in a way that you hadn't done it before, it has to be something that it was new. So yeah. usually those are the best opportunities. So if it, if you meet all the requirements for a job, probably you should look for a different one. You need to go <laughs> the next the next job. Look because how more. often, you know, I'll turn it around as a CHR, how many hiring processes have you been in where the most successful hires were people who had all the boxes checked, right? I agree. I now, as a woman, I'll tell you that I always had the, um, and maybe men too. I don't know. As a person, I'll put it. I'll put it in that regard. But I always had the need to sort of address those things. Maybe we don't even have to address them. But I, I had it. So when I moved from the firm to Baxter as the head of talent, a lot of people told me consultants do not make good um, corporate sort of. You don't know what it is to live in the corporate world. How are you going to bridge that gap? So you know what, my board of directors, people having conversations with me, me understanding what that really meant and how my experience could build into that. Like for me, that was important. And so I don't shy away from those areas. I was like more, okay, here's what I think, you know, here's how I'm going to try to address this. And here's how I think I can bridge some of those gaps. When I move from Baxter to Horizon, really compensation, executive compensation, huge gap for me, right? Here's how I'm planning to address it. Here's how I will work through it. Yeah, great. That's excellent. Um, here's a great question. We talk about when you see biases come up and we've identified a few through our conversation, how have you raised those topics with your CEO or peers and influenced your organization to take action? Because I think we've all been in situations where we see things but how do we find the right words or the right time or the combination of the two to have an impact? I think, you know, and, and I, I don't, you know, I, I don't know who's asking me the question, but I think having some basic training on unconscious bias is really important. So you can put the language out there, right? And when we say unconscious bias, we all know what we're talking about. So, you know, having some, and there's great e-learnings that are out there. You know, there's this great examples that comes up in every training, you know, the, the women in the orchestra in the United States, you know, they were, you know, people were going to auditions and uh, the orchestra one was 100% men until something happened, right? They, they did blind auditions for the, for the orchestra and you couldn't see who was playing the instrument. And suddenly, like a year later, 35% of the orchestra is women. Right. And and uh, and that was just because the pool was smaller. I mean, the, the women were being, you know, were as good as the musicians, those that were showing up as men were. And somehow there was this unconscious bias, like no one who was making this election was saying we're not going to pick the women. So it's so basic and it's so eye opening. Right. You have data to prove that these unconscious biases are at work. So if you, and there's a lot of examples of these. Right. And there's great ones. So if you do some basic training. If you're able in your organization to sit with the executive team and do some basic training, now you have the language out there um, to show the unconscious bias that exists. And there's, there's tons of it. There's tons of it. 
um, to this day and this world. You know, I always share two examples that um, make me mad, but maybe some of you are in this in this page, right? I would show up in my, I would travel a lot. I, I was a consultant. My husband was a professor. So pretty much much more flexibility to be at the playground and pick up the kids from school. And I would travel. So occasionally I would show up in the playground to pick up the kids and someone, a mother, you know, another worker, people would say to me, you're so lucky. You're so lucky. Your husband supports your career and you're able to travel. And I would think whoever told a man, you're so lucky, your wife supports your career and you're able to travel. Like that's not something men ever hear. Like somehow it was okay to tell me that, right? Um, so it's a silly example, but those are biases. And it takes a moment even for me to realize the bias that it's there at work, right? It wasn't like it was so natural. I, I'm like, yeah, I'm really lucky. I actually feel lucky because we have this kind of partnership that you know allows us to make it work as a family. But then you're thinking like, wait a minute, what just happened there? Right. Should this feel lucky or should this feel like it's more the, the general scheme? I get that. Yeah. Um, here's one from someone who's uh, came to the U.S. as an international student. Sounds familiar. Oh, sounds and very familiar. <laughs> they're hoping to stay and work here. What's the most important thing to have in mind when working in a foreign country? Interesting. Uh, I, I. I don't know. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give it a try to that answer. I don't think I fully identify. Uh, I think I would be a foreign worker in Argentina because I've never worked in corporate, in the corporate world there. Right. So, you know, I've, I've traveled and done a few talks. I don't even know the book. Like, I don't know how to performance review. I don't know how to say it in Spanish. You know, it's so funny because obviously it's my first language. And right. um, so I, I don't know that I know that part. I became sort of a worker in this country. But I would say for anyone, uh, understanding the norms is really important. There's different norms and ways of working and there's different cultures, but that's even at a company level, right? There's at a country level, but there's at a company level. But also don't lose the uniqueness that comes with maybe bringing something different to the workplace. Yeah. So I'm all about that celebrating differences. I think that's when we do the best. So whoever you are asking that question, you have a uniqueness that I wouldn't try to hide or, or lose, or I would go to a place that helps me celebrate that and, and, and work with that. I love that. I love that. And here's one that's kind of similar. It says, you know, in the early years of your career, did you ever doubt yourself sometimes um, or feel judged as an, as an immigrant with English as a second language? Coping mechanisms, how do you cope with that? You know, I make a lot, a lot of people make a lot of, you know, I grew up, so by the way, and I think this is an influencer. Um, my mother is Russian. So um, my mother immigrated to um, Argentina and my mother is Russian. Um, and um, my mom spoke Spanish with an accent, speaks Spanish with an accent. Um, and we would sit at the dinner table and make a lot of fun. My brother and I would make a lot of fun about things that my mom would mispronounce or say different or would have like a little bit of a connotation around something that, you know, would sound funny. We would make so much fun of her. And, and guess what? It's payback time for me, right? I have <laughs> American daughters who make fun of me a lot. Um, I, I tend to laugh about these, like, um, and on the language side in particular, if you, if you can make fun of yourself, you're in a much better spot, right? right. Um, I, I don't know. I'm all about celebrating differences. I'm all about um, claiming some cultural elements. I love Latino music. Anytime you are going to ask me what's my favorite song, I'm going to go with something with Shakira because I want to I wanna project and identify with sort of some of the Latino cultural elements that that I want to highlight rather than sort of merge or assimilate in a way that sort of erases differences. Right. So, so you're turning it around. It's not about coping with it. It's about turning it around and finding the strength yeah. and the uniqueness in it. I love yeah. that. I love that. Um, what would be your advice for networking? Um, and this is, you know, especially for a shy woman, like from a personal perspective, trying to network if you're shy, what's some advice for that? Yeah, I, I, I'm not a big proponent, you know, like for many people, networking gets defined by I go to a conference with business cards, which I don't even know if, you know, it's such an old yeah. object these days, you know, with business cards and sort of say, hello, like, who are you? Here's my business card. Here's yours. I mean, for me, that's so pointless. 
pointless. Like, I don't know what comes out of that, if ever anything. But, you know, I sometimes wonder about those calls I get about my insurance being expired or someone who responds to those calls, like who, right. who, who says, okay, let me talk to you. Okay. So um, I, I think it's more purposeful. And some of, look, I'm an extrovert. Maybe you figured that out. I'm an extrovert. So I don't, I don't have an issue sort of talking to people or getting to know them. But I think whether you're an extrovert or an introvert, um, maybe it's more one-on-ones. Maybe it's reaching out to someone, you know, via email and saying, hey, I'm interested in, in, in your work for these reasons. Um, being prepared for those discussions. I often tell the, the you know, the younger, uh, more junior um, newer people in my organization stop by and visit with the executives, but go prepared for those conversations. So if you're shy, I think being prepared and having a set of two or three questions that are specific, that you know what you want to ask, that you have a purpose for the meeting, um, ending the meeting with, can you introduce me to someone else because I'm interested in this field or something. So trying to work that angle more on a uh, I don't think you have to be an extrovert. If you are going to try to catch someone in a conference and strike a meaningful conversation, hard. Hard for the extrovert as well, by the way. Um, yeah, it's, it's so intentional, right? Because I think there was a question earlier that I just kind of skipped over and it was around industry. You know, if you're looking to change industries, how do you network to do that? And I think so many people are quite responsive to, I see that you're in this industry in a similar type of role. I'd love to learn more about X industry. Right. Or who do you know? Knows, right? right. And in order yeah. to do that, you need to know people and you need to yeah. nurture networks. So who do you know? You know, can you like, can you introduce me to someone who knows about these? And, you know, sometimes if I, if someone calls me and says, Hey, I have a friend, blah, blah. Like I'm always going to take that call. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's amazing how scary it is sometimes to ask. But if you're on the receiving end of that, ask how frequently you say yes. Right? Of course, it's a compliment to be asked. There's something nice about being able to extend a hand. Um, and I think the idea of being able to, you know, just to turn that into something else, it kind of reminds me of the secret too, right? Where it's about, all about putting it out there. Well, if you're asking people about an industry or how you want to make a move in your career, you're expanding the number of people who are now looking for you, right? Rooting Absolutely. for you and hoping to help you find that, which I think is great. Um, how does, I'm just looking in, how do you, how do you pick your board of directors? That's a good one. You know, my, uh, I didn't pick my, I mean, of course I picked them, but, but it happens organically. I think. Yeah. If you're, if you're, uh, it's people that you build good relationships with, and some have changed over the years. You know, some some had a um, you know they were terminated from it, and not because they did anything wrong, just evolution of of, of life. But you know, I was thinking, um, you know, I had a there was a partner in the Boston office. Um, his name was Steve. Maybe he's somewhere there. Uh, he, there was a partner at the, in the Boston office. And when I got to Boston, I got into, you know, I was offered a very uh, senior position that I wasn't, I, I wasn't quite sure about how to sort of, I had not led a team and suddenly, you know, I'm here and leading some of the partners and so forth. Um, this is in my consulting. And he was an amazing source of advice and ears to the ground. And so, you know, he became part of, I'm saying those things grow organically, right? Yeah. He became part of my personal board of directors. I don't know if I ever told him that, but you know, when I, then I moved, then I moved to Chicago. I was five years in Chicago before I went to Baxter. But when I'm moving, making the book move to Baxter and I'm being told, you know, some of the concerns that some people raise is do consultants make good leaders, functional leaders. Yeah. Right. Or do they, you know, do consult our consultants good functional leaders? I remember picking up the phone and calling Steve and saying, Steve, you know, have you, what do you think? What do you think about me in this role? How do you think I should address this question? So, you know, and of course I had been in touch with Steve since, but I'm giving you an example of how these things, you know, for me, he was like a perfect person to do this because by the way, he left the firm two years later to take a, a, a role in a company. So he had that experience. I had stayed in touch with him. He knew me really well. Um, so how do you pick them? It's people that you trust, you know, have your back mm -hmm. and that um, you trust that you can have a honest, open, transparent conversation and would steer you 
right. And that sometimes means giving you tough feedback. Yeah, it's, it's someone who's going to give you feedback is really important, oh, right? Absolutely. That you want to hear. Um, this is this is that, that. Sorry, that question's too long, and we only have a couple of minutes left. Um, there's a few here on you know balancing work and life, um, right? Any any advice from your experience in terms of how do you make time for it all, or is that just a dream? Yeah, I, I'm of a generation, I was talking about this with my husband and my nephew yesterday, who's 25. I think I'm, we are, I'm, I'm of a generation where work is an important part of, of who I am. I don't know that that's the case for this younger generation, and there's nothing wrong with that. It's just different. different. Um, so uh, we, we searched, I think a lot of us, a lot of us in my generation search for less balance because, you know, this is who we are and careers are an important part of who we are so it's not about sort of that dichotomy between work and life mm, work is life yeah. um to some extent right i also want to enjoy my my kids i want to enjoy travel with my husband i want to you know i want to i uh, there's i want to see my mother who still uh i am a caregiver for so there's there's things that we have to juggle that are that are difficult and i think um I don't know, it depends so much on each individual situation, but um, I think, um, you know, finding a way and an ecosystem is super important. And I, I, this is a topic that I think, I mean, the board of directors of many people just trying to sort it out, but it's very individual. My, what worked for me might not work for anyone else. Yeah. So much of it, it's time of life too, right? What's a priority today was yeah. not a priority five years ago, will not be a priority yeah. in five years. And so my solutions are different. Irina, this has been such a pleasure. Thank you so much for the generosity of your time, of your insights and your experience. We totally appreciate it. I want to thank everyone else who's also joined today for your questions and for your listening. Um, thank you so much. Have a great day. This will be up on YouTube for those of you who uh, want to share it with others, want to review it. Um, and uh, Irina, look forward to the next opportunity to share your insights as well. Thank you, Margo, so much. I enjoyed the conversation. Bye for now, everybody.